Good evening, all. You are all welcome to this second session of our lecture on fluid and electrolyte. We discussed fluid and fluid imbalance. Today, we'll continue with um, electrolyte imbalance. And we are going to start with <clears throat> potassium. We should know that potassium is a very important serum electrolyte because it regulates intracellular um, osmolality. It maintains intracellular neutrality in response to hydrogen, ion, and sodium. So there is a exchange mechanisms that occur depending on the concentrations of these um, ions and potassium helps in maintaining a neutral environment balance. It helps for glucose deposit in the liver and skeletal muscles because you see the role of potassium infusion into the cell is aided. Okay, it aids the deposition of um, glucose into the cell to form glycogen. So it also maintains normal cardiac rhythm. It maintains smooth muscles and skeletal muscle contraction and nerve conduction. So we are going to see imbalances in this um, serum electrolyte, the various manifestations and the way you address the conditions they present with. Okay, now we'll start with hypokalemia. Hypokalemia is serum sodium and serum potassium of less than 3.5 millimoles per liter. Please, in your lecture note, there is a typographical error, so you correct that. It's a serum potassium of less than 3.5 millimoles per liter. And the manifestation of hypokalemia depends on the level or the extent. It could be a mild, moderate, or severe hypokalemia, where you have a serum level of less than 3.5. Generally, you call this hypokalemia. But it could be between 3.0 to 3.5. Okay, it could be between 2.5 to 3.0 or less than 2.5 millimoles per liter. Okay, so you have mild, moderate, and severe hypokalemia. And the various causes of hypokalemia include diarrhea, vomiting, enterocutaneous fistula, gastric outlet obstruction, peritonitis, intestinal obstruction, diuretic therapy, diabetes mellitus, and alkalosis. So if a patient is losing a lot of fluid from vomiting, a liter of vomiting contains about nine millimoles of potassium. So patients vomiting recurrently, he will lose significant amount of potassium, which will drastically reduce the serum potassium. Diarrhea, enterocutaneous fistula loss from intestine. You know, in gastric outlet obstruction, predominantly is the gastric content that is being vomited. Okay, peritonitis and intestinal obstruction are third space losses. And in third space losses, where you have accumulation of fluid, 
they could present with hypokalemia. Now, patients will have muscle weakness. If you remember the functions of potassium, there is nerve and muscle con uh, contraction, muscle contraction, nerve conduction. So when a patient presents with hypokalemia, they will have muscle weakness, lethargy. They have slow speech and paralytic ileus because the smooth muscles of the intestine will lose contraction. So they become paralytic. So because of lack of paralysis, uh, lack of peristalsis, they will become distended. Okay, and patient will have constipation. Because the patient's, the intestine is not contracting. They have cardiac arrhythmias, hyporeflexia, because of reduction in nerve conduction and muscle contraction. They can also present with cardiac arrest, especially if the patient um, has um, severe hypokalemia. And this results from the extensive arrhythmias they present with. And the ECG changes. Now you should take note. This is a very important MCQ stuff. The ECG changes in hypokalemia. You have a depressed ST segment, an inverted T wave, a prominent U wave, prolonged QT interval, tachycardia, and ectopic beat. Now, this picture shows the ECG changes in hypokalemia. You can see a prolonged PR, okay, interval. There's a there's ST segment depression and P wave is slightly peaked. T wave is shallow and you have a prominent U wave. If you remember the normal ECG wave, okay? If you remember the, your normal ECG wave, okay? So you can see the entire PR interval in, e, uh, what do you call it? Hypokalemia is prolonged. And one important thing you should know, there is a prominent U wave. And when you examine them, they will have ectopic beats. So please take note of this because of your MCQs. ECG changes seen in all the electrolytes abnormalities. Okay, let's proceed. How is hypokalemia treated? Now, this is one of the most important aspects of electrolyte imbalance, especially for house officers. It is a must you know how to correct hypokalemia. If you don't take editing out of this lecture, you must know how to correct hypokalemia. Now, one of the most important precautions you should ensure a patient is making adequate urine. Because if a patient is not making urine, that means the patient cannot excrete any form of electrolyte that, it's, that is being administered parenterally. And when you administer potassium without being well distributed in circulation for excretion, okay, it will exact a pseudo effect. Even the serum level is low, but the infusion you gave will exert its effect on the heart and the patient will have cardiac arrest. So you must ensure patient is making adequate urine. 
So even if a patient have this electrolytemia, several forms of electrolyte uh, dysfunction, you have to hydrate the patient, okay? Make sure he's making adequate urine before you start correcting hypokalemia. So if a patient presents with a serum level that is low, let's say 2.5 millimoles. Now, this is the patient's observed value. It's 2.5, okay? Now, you need to get a desired value. How do you get the desired value? It's taking the average of the normal range, the normal serum range. That is how you get the desired value. We said the upper limit is 5.6. The lower limit is 3.5 plus 5.6. Divide by two. Okay, you get something around, let's say, 4.2. Okay, that is the desired. Okay, then deficits in that patient will be desired minus the observed. So that is the patient's deficit. So what is the formula now for calculating, uh, for correcting hypokalemia? Correcting hypokalemia Okay, you, the deficit in patients times weight of the patient times a constant, which is 0 0.6, when you are correcting um, cations. If you remember, we said total body water from 60% of body weight. So you use <clears throat> 0 0.6 as your constant. Now, you see your deficit is the desired 4.2 minus the observe, which is 2.5 times the weight of the patient. Let's assume it's a 70 kg individual times 0 0.6. Now, you should know that when correcting potassium, you must add daily maintenance plus daily maintenance of that patient. Because every day he requires a maintenance um, value to run the normal metabolic function that requires potassium. So, don't forget to correct potassium. You have a desired minus observed. Okay. Times weight of the patient times constant plus daily maintenance. Now, the daily maintenance for potassium is one to two millimoles per kg. And because of the um, effect of potassium, you don't want to, you use the lower limit. So you always use one millimoles per kg. If the patient, we say the 70 kg, so you add plus 
70. That is 1 millimoles per kg is 1 times 70 plus 70 kg. So whatsoever you calculate from this, you add to 70. You add 70, which is his daily maintenance. So that is how you calculate um, and correct um, potassium. So we said ensure patient is making adequate urine, preferably under ECG monitoring. You calculate using the formula desired minus observe times weight of the patient times 0 0.6, which is the constant, plus the daily maintenance of the patient, which is one millimole per kg. Now, aside this first precaution we mentioned, to ensure patient is making adequate urine, there are some other precautions of administration of potassium using potassium chloride. You must ensure that it's not more than 20 millimoles per hour. The rate of administration should not exceed 20 millimoles per hour, or it shouldn't be more than 40 millimoles per liter of fluid. So if you are administering the fluid, you don't use, um, you don't give more than 40 millimoles in one liter of the IV fluid, you are adding the potassium chloride. And it shouldn't be more than 120 millimoles per day to avoid, okay, the effect of hyperkalemia. And what fluid do we commonly use in correction? We use normal saline, okay? Use normal saline in the correction because you don't want to use a um, potassium, uh, sorry, a glucose containing fluid, okay? Because if you use a glucose containing fluid, it triggers more insulin release and insulin will further push the uh, potassium into the cells. So after correction, you have to check uh, urea and electrolyte daily, okay? Then if you have achieved a serum correction, you can give uh, a supplement orally when patient can take orally. But you should know we prefer to use correct, uh, parenteral means. Hmm? We use parenteral for correction of potassium using potassium chloride. And this potassium chloride comes in various vials. You will see some vials, okay, that come in 10 millimoles. You will see some that come in 20 millimoles. Okay, then you see some that even come in grams. So you, you have to um, get your appropriate vial and correct as appropriate. Now, hyperkalemia, when a serum potassium exceeds 5.6 millimoles per liter, it occurs in renal failure. You see, it's not excreting excess of potassium. So this tends to accumulate. In patients with shock, in shock, patients with metabolic acidosis. At the end of the lecture, I want one of the candidates to tell me what is the relationship between acidosis and hyperkalemia. Yeah. So in massive crush injury, I, if you remember in our first lecture, we said the predominant intracellular cation is potassium. So when you have a tissue injury, there's libration of potassium, okay? If you have a crush injury, there's libration of potassium, which accumulates in the serum. Acute rhabdomyolysis, limb ischemia, severe bones, tumor lysis syndrome, massive blood transfusion. Yes, because um, 
when we discuss blood, you understand that there's leakage of potassium into the serum in a stored blood from the red blood cells. And for every day, it's the serum, the, the potassium in a stored blood increase by one millimoles every day. So if you have a stored blood for 20 days, it means the potassium has increased by 20 millimoles. So if you are giving massive blood transfusion, which is infusion of patients, total equivalence of a total blood volume in 24 hours, or half of his total blood volume in an hour, that is massive blood transfusion. And if you are using an old blood, this patient will have hyperkalemia. Drugs like aminoglycoside, ACE inhibitors, potassium sparing diuretics, and so on. Okay. Now, the clinical features include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, muscle weakness. The ECG changes. You see, this is one of the most prominent ECG change you should never forget in hyperkalemia. They have a tall, tented T wave, absent P wave, widening QRS complex, ventricular arrhythmias, fibrillation, and they can also have cardiac arrest. Now, the cardiac arrest. You should, you should be able to differentiate cardiac arrest in hyperkalemia and cardiac arrest in hypercalcemia. This occurs in diastole. And this occurs in cysto. We'll talk about that later. So there is, these are the ECT changes. You can see there's a tall T wave here. There's depressed LT segment also, widening QRS complex. Okay, here P wave is flattened and this prolonged PR. Now, let us compare this with hypokalemia. If you look at this, here there is prominent U wave, which is absent. And the T wave here is shallow, while in hyperkalemia is tall, okay? There is prolonged ST, there's prolonged PR interval and there's ST segment de depression here. Okay, here there's widening QRL, RS, prolonged PR, and there's still ST segment depression. So how is hyperkalemia treated? You treat the underlying cause of hyperkalemia. Um, it should be treated under ECG monitoring. Now, you remember we said insulin push the um, potassium into the cell. So you give 10 international units of soluble insulin in one liter of 5% dextrose water to run over 30 minutes. So because the insulin push, it pushes the, uh, what do you call it? the glucose along with potassium into the cells, and this will reduce the serum um, potassium. You give 10 mils of 10% calcium gluconate over 10 minutes. Now, why do you give calcium gluconate? It protects the heart. If you are to start with anything, start with this, because this pro prevents cardiac arrest. So it stabilizes the cardiac membrane to prevent cardiac arrest. So you give 10 mils of 10% cal uh, calcium gluconate over 10 minutes. Now, because 
hyperkalemia is associated with acidosis. I've not forgotten my question. You give sodium bicarbonate, 8200 millimoles over 10 minutes. Now, this is, these are the measures you use for correction of parenteral um, hyperkalemia. And it's an emergency, please. It's something you have to take with all seriousness because patients can just develop cardiac arrest and that is all. Now, you can also give calcium resonium, which are, is an ion exchange resin. Okay, it is given either power orally or transrectally, it exchanges um, calcium, okay, from the bowel and it chelates calcium and they are excreted in the feces. Beta-2 agonists like salbutamol also reduces serum calcium. You can give hemodialysis. Now let's talk about sodium. Sodium is also an important serum electrolyte. It's the most important extracellular cation. It maintains the extracellular osmolality and it helps to transmit impulse. It maintains serum acid base balance. If someone uses via sodium bicarbonate, if a patient has acidosis, it retains sodium bicarbonate. The body retains sodium bicarbonate in the kidneys. If the patient has alkalosis, the body excretes sodium bicarbonate via the kidneys. So sodium is an important um, electrolyte. And the serum <clears throat> level of sodium usually is given as 135 to 145 millimoles per liter. Now, you see a patient have hypokalemia when it is less than 130, it's mild. 130 to 120 to 130 is moderate hyponatremia and severe Aponatremia is when it's less than 120 millimoles per liter. And they present with headaches, lethargy, seizures, and coma. And you know, patient develops symptoms of hypokalemia. They develop symptoms when the serum level is less than 125 millimoles per liter, and they convulse when it's less than 120 millimoles. Take note, when they develop severe hyponatremia, they start convulsing. And common causes are hydrogenic when you are giving uh, diluted fluids, okay? Or an increased ADH in conditions of that cause increased ADH secretion like in head injury, and post-operative patients. So you have to be careful when giving plain uh, fluid that do, does not contain electrolytes in the post-operative period or a patient with head injury. Now, in some chronic conditions, they could present with chronic hyponatremia that is lingering for a very long time, like in syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, in small cell lung cancers, carcinoids, tumors, brain tumors, infections, AIDS, okay, from renal losses, post obstructive diuresis, polycystic disease. These are conditions that are associated with hyponatremia. And because they are chronic conditions, patients will be having chronic hyponatremia. How is it treated? For acute hyponatremia, you have to treat as dehydration because, um, of course, we know sodium is the predominant extracellular um, cation. So when there is depletion of sodium, it goes along with water. So the patient will be dehydrated. So for acute form of hyponatremia, they come up with what dehydration. So you treat as dehydration. While for the chronic form, 
it is corrected slowly. Patient presenting with chronic hyponatremia, you have to correct slowly. If not, if you rapidly correct chronic hyponatremia, patient will come up with a condition that is called central pontal myelinosis. And they present with spastic quadriparesis, pseudobulbar palsy, and coma. Okay, so you have to correct slowly. You give not more than 0.2 milli equivalents per hour or 8 milli equivalents per day. Now, you see hypernatremia now when it exceeds, when it's greater than 145 millimoles per liter. It's moderate when it is 146 to 159 milli equivalent per liter. My second question, you should tell me the difference between millimoles per liter. All these are questions. The first one, I've not forgotten. The second one, milli equivalents per liter. Okay. What do they call cerebral dehydration, coma, seizure, hemorrhage, postural hypertension? Okay. It is rare in conscious. They cause tests if patient is conscious. The causes could be hydrogenic when you are infusing high potassium uh, serum, when you are infusing high sodium content, infusion with high sodium content, hypernatremia result when you are giving parenteral high doses of um, sodium. It can occur in diabetes insipidus. <clears throat> chronic renal failure, I'll just, I'll just run excess. Now, one important note about the treatment of hypernatremia is to treat the underlying cause. Because if the underlying cause is not eliminated, you won't be able to correct it. And you correct the hydration with normal saline, okay? you still use normal saline to correct the dehydration, okay? Because it's a crystalloid, it can cross, it can diffuse to the interstitial space and into the cells also. And excess of sodium will be excreted in the kidneys, but the fluid will be retained. Now, Give electrolyte free fluid after correction of the hydration. Okay. Then um, you now maintain the serum osmolality. Now you have a formula for calculating uh, changes in serum sodium. But you may not necessarily go into this. Now, the next important electrolyte is high, uh, calcium. A patient have, will develop hypocalcemia if the serum calcium is less than two millimoles per liter, and the causes will include hypoparathyroidism because you know parathyroid hormone increases serum calcium. And one of the conditions where you could have this is during thyroidectomy. Surgery for removing the thyroid gland can inadvertently remove the parathyroid gland and patient will come up with hypocalcemia. Okay, and these tend to occur in three to five days after the surgery. And when the glands are removed, patient will start developing symptoms. The first symptom they notice is psychomoral numbness. They will now have facial twitching. Then they will develop spasms, carpal spasms, pedal spasms, carpopedal spasms, acute and chronic renal failure, okay? 
acute pancreatitis, massive soft tissue infections, massive blood transfusion, tumor lysis syndrome. Now, if you read about tumor lysis syndrome, what do you need to know about tumor lysis syndrome? Electrolyte changes. Electrolyte changes. How does it cause hypocalcemia? Then what are the clinical manifestations of tumor lysis syndrome? Now in massive blood transfusion, you should know that the blood contain anticoagulant. And the anticoagulant citrate citrate tends to chelate calcium. So if you give massive blood transfusion, there's large amount of uh, uh, anticoagulant, and this will chelate the serum calcium, and patient will have hypocalcemia. Okay, you have CPDA, citrate phosphate dextrose adenine. This is an example of anticoagulant that is in the blood bag. So the citrate tends to chelate the serum calcium. Now, patients will have numbness, convulsions, arrhythmia, tetany, paralysis, paresthesias of the face and extremities, muscle cramps, spasms, okay? They may convulse. Now, you should know how to develop, de demonstrate the signs, the chivostic signs and the trosial sign. Okay? The chivostic signs and the trosial sign. Now, when you tap the facial nerve at its exit, there is twitching of the facial muscle that will dem that you demonstrate Chivostic sign, you tap the facial nerve at the lower angle of the jaw, at the exit, okay? You have twitching of the facial muscle. This, when you use a sphig, inflate the cuff to up to 20 millimeters of mercury above the patient's systolic pressure. Patient develop carpal spasms. So this is very important. You know how to demonstrate these signs. When the blood pressure is elevated to 20 millimeters of mercury above the systolic pressure, patient develops spasms. What are the ECG changes? There's prolonged QT interval, T wave inversion, Ventricular fibrillation. If mild or asymptomatic, can be treated orally. Okay, like calcium sandals, calcium carbonate um, suspension. But if severe, you have to give parenteral calcium gluconate using 10 ml of calcium gluconate in 10 ml of 5 or 10% dextrose water over 10 minutes. If no response, in 10 minutes, you repeat the dose. Then you now place patients on maintenance for the next 48 hours. Afterwards, you switch to oral therapy. Hypercalcemia is serum calcium of more than 2.5 millimoles per um, liter, but symptoms occur when it is greater than 3.5 millimoles per liter. The causes could be endocrine, from primary hyperparathyroidism, okay, or secondary hyperparathyroidism. Then you have parathyroid adenomas or carcinomas. Patients could have thyrotoxicosis, Addison's disease. These are all causes of hypercalcemia. From bone diseases like myeloma, lymphoma, Paget's disease, secondary bone tumors. As it lies, the bone, they tend to liberate calcium. 
Absorption induced like vitamin D excess, vitamin A, aluminum intoxication, mill alkaline syndrome, sarcoidosis. Now it is expected of you to go and do more readings on all these courses because um, it is expected you will you may see some of these courses in the multiple choice questions and uh, if you understand some of the mechanism by which all these are course you will not forget they present with neurological symptoms like depression confusion stupor or coma they could present with musculoskeletal symptoms like weakness back and extremity pain, renal, polyuria, polydipsia, as kidney lost their ability to concentrate urine, gastrointestinal symptoms like anorexia, nausea, vomiting, constipation, abdominal pain, and weight loss. The treatment, treat hypercalcemia first, then treat the underlying cause because of the effect of hypercalcemia. If severe and due to malignancy, correct fluid deficit with normal cilia, then administer loop diuretics like frusemide, they tend to depress renal calcium absorption. If there's renal failure, you see, you just have to do hemodialysis because the, the, the kidney the kidneys can no longer maintain homeostasis. So you just do a hemodialysis. If severe hypercalcemia is due to release of calcium by bone tumors, if by phosphonates, pamidronate, or ibandronate, okay? Now, hypomagnesemia. Now, this is very common, especially those patients that are not on oral feeding for a very long time. They are on parenteral nutrition or those patients that have um, prolonged GI loss. So patients on prolonged IV fluid and GI losses, they will present with hypomagnesemia. And uh, patient um, undergoing cardiac surgery with cardiopulmonary um, perfusion, myo cardiac infarction, acute pancreatitis, cirrhosis, alcoholism, small bowel resection, malabsorption, they present with hypomagnesemia. This is very common in patients with um, um, TPN. Now, what you need to know Hypomagnesemia, they present typically like features of hypocalcemia. The features of hypomagnesemia present with features of hypokalemia. And you should, that is one thing you need to know about this. Secondly, you need to know patients with hypomagnesemia will have a refractory hypokalemia. So sometimes you keep on correcting the potassium. It fails to correct because there is um, hypomagnesemia. Because hypomagnesemia will stimulate excessive renal loss of potassium. So that's why patient with hypomagnesemia will have a refractory hypokalemia. So if the patient, you keep on correcting potassium, it fails to correct. You have to assess the serum magnesium. And if it is low, you have to correct it. If not, the kidneys will keep on losing um, potassium. So they present with neuro muscular hyperactivity, tremors, twitching, hyperreflexia, ileus, fix, behavioral di disturbance. They also have the trosios and chivostic sign, just like in hypocalcemia. Now, 
Don't forget, features of magnesemia, hypomagnesemia are similar to those of hypocalcemia. How is it treated? You give 20 millimoles of magnesium sulfate in 24 hours in dextrose saline or 0 0.25 millimoles per kg per day. In severe, you give one millimoles per kg per day. Now, hypermagnesemia is when serum magnesium is greater than one millimoles per liter and it is rare. And usually it's in patients with chronic kidney diseases, you see. Then it um, can occur in excessive intake like prolonged parenteral nutrition, magnesium containing laxatives. Because you have, you know, all these laxatives are magnesium trisilicates, most of them. So if you keep on taking that, um, they, they can, you, patient may develop hypermagnesemia. And patient will present with gastrointestinal symptoms like nausea and vomiting, neuromuscular symptoms like weakness, lethargy, um, decreased reflexes, cardiac, cardiovascular symptoms like hypertension and cardiac arrest. You have to withhold exogenous sources of potassium, correct any form of dehydration, correct acidosis if present. If acute symptoms are present, give them minimals of what? Calcium chloride to antagonize calcium, cardiac, uh, cardiac uh, effects. And of course, you know the ultimate um, therapy for correcting uh, electrolyte derangement, especially if it is refractory, it's um, hemodialysis. So we've completed our first lecture on fluid and electrolyte therapy. So what is expected of you now? You, the expectation, um, what is expected of you after your fluid and electrolyte therapy. One, you should master the slide. Okay. Two, you should read from the textbook. And the recommended textbook for this is the Bedo, your Baja. textbook uh, it's a tropical textbook including pathology in the tropics i'm going to give you the review of the textbooks um, that are required for your preparation and also you should watch the videos frequently okay you should watch the videos on the channel especially the short videos we did on uh, fluid and electrolyte. I shared the link today, this afternoon, after your discussion. Master them very well. Fluid and electrolyte, it forms the basis, your foundation of your patient care, because you need to <clears throat> know how to administer fluid properly for your other um, treatment to take effect. So I'm going to entertain questions. Yes, if you have any questions, I'll allow you to unmute yourself and you can ask your questions. So any question, please. Yes. It appears there is no question. Good, good evening, Doctor. Okay. Dr. Jamilu Ibrahim Ahmed, what is your question? Go ahead. Doctor, for me, my own question is from the other lecture we had on fluid and electrolytes. Okay, fluids, yes. Go ahead. I need more, more, more explanation on Daru da, solution. Daru solution. I know is. Okay. 
Yes, any other question? No. Okay. Yes, I'm taking. Yes, any other question? Any other question? Okay, so we have only one question. Now, Darrow solution, I told you, uh, Darrow solution is a crystalloid. And I told you crystalloids are clear aqueous solution of low molecular weights in contrast to colloids that are high molecular weight plasma expanders. Now crystalloids um, are salts dissolved in water. Darrow's is a form of crystalloids and there are two forms. There is the full strength, and the half strength. They are electrolytes, but the most important electrolyte in Darrow's is the potassium content. The full strength has 36 millimoles in one liter of Darrow's, while the half strength has 18 millimoles. So if you need to administer fluid that that contains potassium, okay? Like patient with diarrhea that is passing a lot of cholera, um, that has cholera, that is passing a lot of rice water stool, they are losing a lot of potassium. So you should add darrows in their maintenance fluid so that the potassium loss, okay, will be replaced. These, I'm not saying you are using darrows to correct uh, potassium deficit. <laughs> Calcium chloride to correct parenteral potassium. And when it is corrected, your maintenance fluid, if patient is ongoing loss of potassium, like patient with cholera, you can add Daru solution because it has a um, larger amount of um, potassium as compared to other crystalloids. If you look at the table, we showed you on the commonly used um, electrolyte, okay? If you look at the table on the commonly used electrolyte, sorry, the commonly used IV fluids, look at Daros. Daros, you can see it has 124 millimoles of sodium, 36 millimoles of potassium. This is full strength arrows. It doesn't have calcium. It has 104 millimoles of chloride, 56 millimoles of bicarbonate, and the osmolality is 320. Is that, is that clear? Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. So, 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 doctor, that means we only use it in maintenance, right? Yes, you use it in maintenance, in fluids that you need high potassium content, okay? Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Because the reason why you don't want to use it for correction, when you calculate the deficits in a patient, you will be running in hundreds, okay? You will be running in hundreds. Maybe you calculated a deficit and the patient requires 120 millimoles. And this one liter has 36 millimoles, okay? And the, the 24 hour fluid requirement of a patient is three liters, okay? And you don't want to give all the fluids that there is no glucose in it. The sodium content is not enough. You understand? So that's why you can't use it as a fluid for correcting deficits. It won't be enough because you are correcting fluid and electrolyte at the same time. So you rather use it as a maintenance fluid in combination with another fluid, maybe a dextrose containing fluid or a supplemented 
sodium containing fluid. Yes, any other question? Yes, who wants to answer my question since you don't have question? Anybody wants to attempt my question? Okay, nobody is attempting my question. So, uh, yeah, please. yes, Dr. Aisha, you want to attempt? Yes, Dr. Aisha, we can hear you. Uh, can you repeat the question? Okay. My question is, what is the relationship between hyperkalemia and alkalosis? Sorry, acidosis. That's the first question. What is the second question? Who can remind us of the second question? Uh, minimal the versus... Difference, difference between uh, minimal per liter and uh, milli-equivalent milli per liter. Yes. Aisha, over to you. I'm not sure, but I think um, with regards to the first question, uh, maybe to maintain like uh, equilibrium inside the cell, because the more um, I, I mean, the more the more like uh... okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we thought your network went off, but we can hear you clearly. Oh, no. Yeah, because um, hydrogen ions, like, they go in, into the cells and in exchange for, like, potassium to maintain uh, the correct uh, action potential, something like that, I think. I'm not sure. Hydrogen ion goes into the cell. Yes, and potassium um, in exchange for potassium. In exchange for potassium. Can anybody help us? Like that, me, I'm thinking. Uh, you are still thinking. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I'm saying. Uh, hyperkalemia interferes with the secretion of uh, ammonia from the kidney. So the accumulation of ammonia in the system will cause the, the, the acidosis. I'm not sure. Why is all of you not sure? Okay, I'll still leave it as an assignment. I won't tell you why, because I want you to read. It's very simple. Aisha has an idea, but she could not put it together. Uh, Chief. Yes? I think she's on the right track, but it's supposed to be during hyperkalemia. There is an exchange of um, potassium and hydrogen ions from the inside of the cell to outside. As extra cellular, not intra cellular. Okay, so what do you say? Yes. These so the hydrogen are, ions actually go outside of the this cell. This is the serum. Yes. What goes out of the cell? Hydrogen ions. Okay. What goes and in? Potassium goes into the cell. You know how to clean it. So what happens at the level of the kidneys then? Yes, acid base balance. Okay. I'll leave you to read tomorrow. Someone will tell someone will explain in detail, but all of you should read it. 
Yes, the next question. Who wants to attempt? Yes. Mini moles per liter, mini equivalents per liter. Dr. Nura, yes, you want to tell us? Yes. Mini equivalent is often used uh, for plasma electrolyte concentration. And mini equivalent is related to number of minimals and electrical changes of ions in solution, sir. Yes. And in the millimoles, sir, there is 1,000 of a mole. And mini equivalent is also thousands of a mole. That equivalent is equivalent. Do not thank God this is recorded. When you sir. check, you review your answer. Okay, sir. <laughs> you realize. Okay. Now, I want you to know that sometimes you will see some uh, electrolyte be set, for example, sodium. We said maybe 130 millimoles per liter. And we said sodium ion 130 equivalent per liter. They are the same. But when you come to calcium, for example, Okay, if you say maybe two millimoles per liter is different from calcium, two milli equivalents per liter, they are not the same, but for sodium is the same. The difference is milli equivalents, okay? Milli equivalents is millimoles of an electrolyte times the valency of that electrolyte. The reason why uh, sodium 130 millimoles and 130 milli equivalents are the same is because the valency is one. While if you look at calcium, the valency is two. So millimoles and milli equivalents are not the same. This is you tie you multiply the valency with millimoles. So in the case you see values given, and it shouldn't. The reason why I'm telling you this so that it doesn't confuse you. They are both used for serum electrolyte, but this is the difference. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Okay, so we are going to stop. Tomorrow I'll be on transit, but in the evening I'm going to share your assignment. You are going to do assignments on um, there are hundred questions. All of you will do your the assignment and submit on Tuesday, please. Okay. You can come for group discussions, but tomorrow you will have an assignment. Please, I will upload it tomorrow in the evening. So I won't be available in the morning to, um, to give you a lecture, but tomorrow evening, God's willing, I'm going to share a link and I'll discuss how you will do the assignment. So thank you very much. And finally, you should know um, your group discussions and those assignments will really help you in passing the exams because they are going to be multiple choice questions. You answer those assignments. In fact, 
assignment is one of the most important components of this our tutorials because it will give you an opportunity to do an in-depth reading on your own i will give you 24 hours to submit the assignment so you have time to consult all your textbooks and read then your answer and submit thank you very much we've come to the end of this class for today Oh, Dr. Mariam, do you have any comments? No, sir, I don't. Okay, thank you very much.